name is Mark Cusack. I'm the House Chair of the Joint Committee on Revenue. I'm calling this hearing to order. Uh, joining with us today in person to my right is uh, David Linsky, the House Vice Chair. Uh, and Representative Turku is here. He just stepped out. And joining us virtually is Representative Brandy Fluker Oakley. We have a little over, I think about 25 people signed up to testify today. Uh, we just ask that you do keep it brief and submit written testimony. We try to keep everyone to about three minutes. Um, and we do take our elected colleagues out of order when they do uh, come in or join us virtually. Um, the two reps signed up have not signed on. No. So we will move along with our list. And the first up to testify will be Michael Mamolo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, your time. Uh, distinguished members of the Joint Committee, uh, my name is Michael Memolo. I'm the Interim Executive Director at the MCAD. I have submitted written testimony, but would like to briefly uh, testify in support of House Bill 2813, an act relative to creating the Massachusetts Against Discrimination Fund. I would first like to thank Representative Carlos Gonzalez for sponsoring this bill and for his tireless work in supporting the MCAD uh, in our mission. Simply put, House Bill 2813 would create a fund that would allow any individual to donate to the MCAD to support our mission and work. The fund would allow for direct donations as well as make the MCAD fund an eligible entity that individuals can voluntarily donate to when filing their Massachusetts income taxes. Under this change, the MCAD fund would join funds such as the Department of Agriculture's Homeless Animal Prevention and Care Fund and others that are similarly authorized for individuals to donate all or part of their tax returns. For the past 33 years, the Commission has been statutorily authorized to receive funds directly from the public. Since this change was made in 1990, the agency has not sought the ability to utilize the statutory power in this way. Candidly, when this bill was first proposed in last legislative session and before the MCAD was fully funded, we offered the MCAD fund as one solution to support our agency operations as we face significant revenue loss from reductions to our federal work share contracts. Since then, much have changed, as all of you and your colleagues in the House and the Senate, uh, together with the governor, made the historic decision to fully fund the Mass Commission Against Discrimination and eliminate our reliance on our federal contracts. Truly a landmark decision for the Commonwealth and our collective commitment to protecting civil rights. In light of this tremendous achievement, we continue to support House Bill 2813 and the creation of this fund. Maintaining the MCAD fund on the books would allow us to leverage this potential revenue stream should the Commonwealth face an economic downturn. The MCAD has been heavily impacted during these times of economic uncertainty. The agency has submitted to equitable cuts other state agency received under 9C reductions during these times. In addition to these cuts, accompanying furloughs and staff reductions were truly crippling to our agency and our work. Although much has changed since then, since then, we strongly feel that enabling our agency to avail itself of this fund would help guard against the devastating effects of any future downturns or recessions. In closing, we view this fund as a means to protect and bolster the Commonwealth's investment in the MCAD and to preserve the continued efficiency of our agency in the downtimes. Thank you again, and I again urge your support for House Bill 2813. Thank you, Michael. Any comments or questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Uh, joining us virtually is Karen Arpino. Muted. We can't hear you. My apologies. You'd think I'd never done this before. Chair Moran, Chair Cusick, and members of the Joint Committee on Revenue, thank you for welcoming me to speak today. My name is Karen Arpino. I'm the Executive Director of the Northeast Hearth, Patio, and Barbecue Association, or NEHPBA. The Northeast HPBA is a trade association representing more than 300 individual member hearth and fireplace retail and related companies throughout the Northeast with over 60 members in Massachusetts. Most of our members are independent mom and pop small businesses. 
Thank you for the opportunity to offer testimony today in support of House Bill 2941, specifically Section 5, Subsection 1, the Wood Stove Changeout Program. In addition to the fact that passing this bill would provide renewable wood products and support local economies, I'd like to talk to you about the vast financial, economic, and environmental benefits of wood stove changeout programs. It's important to bear in mind that as of May 15, 2020, the EPA put into effect a much more aggressive emission standard for wood burning stoves called the New Source Performance Standard or NSPS. The NSPS for wood burning stoves requires that all stoves sold after May 15, 2020 only emit two grams of smoke per hour. That's less than one cigarette. It is illegal to sell wood stoves that do not meet the standards set forth by this new standard. Standard, standards are required passing grades that must be achieved to be legal to sell in all 50 states. However, many households across the Commonwealth are still burning wood stoves that predate this more stringent regulation, with the oldest unregulated appliance emitting, emitting upwards of 60 grams per hour. Massachusetts has done a wood stove changeout program before in conjunction with um, the hearth industry and the American Lung Association. It was a $2 million wood stove changeout program in Central Mass, Eastern Connecticut and Rhode Island. The program takes older wood burning stoves out of use and helps replace them with high efficiency wood burning stoves across the region. However, there's still more to be done to replace these old inefficient stoves. Old wood burning stoves and old pellet stoves are often found in homes that are very hard or very expensive to heat. They're often used as a supplemental heat source. They're also often found in homes where families are struggling to pay utility bills, and in these situations, they're often used as primary heat. The best way to increase efficiency in these homes is to change out the old heating stoves for a newer EPA certified one. The EPA in many Northeastern states, including Massachusetts, have sponsored wood stove changeout programs in the past. This bill, H2941, presents another opportunity to offer a changeout program to Massachusetts. The, emiss the emissions testing that was done in the early 1990s revealed that older stoves emit too much methane in particular, particulates. Therefore, changing out old stoves not only reduces particulate pollution, but also reduces very potent greenhouse gas emissions. Newer wood burning stoves burn more efficiently, reducing firewood usage, making them more cost effective to burn for families struggling with utility bills. We, NEPA and its membership across the state, urge the Joint Committee on Revenue to vote yes on House Bill 2941 to approve the creation of a wood stove changeout program. Families need your help in staying warm and safe in their homes by being able to purchase today's clean burning EPA certified wood stoves. Thank you for your consideration of our comments. Please do not hesitate to call me with any questions and I'll be submitting my written testimony as well. Thank you, Mr. Arpino. Any comments or questions from the committee? None. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Uh, next joining us virtually is George Sanders. You're you're muted, George. Can you hear me now? We can now, yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. My name is George A. Sanders, Sr. here. I'm speaking on Bill House 2693. That was submitted by uh, Representative James Assyrio. Uh, I first started working with uh, Gary Farm, which is in Littleton, uh, back in 2014 and trying to get his property to, to become under the 61A. He has about three acres of land there, but he has land in, I believe, Groton, Pepper, and Townsend. And um, this bill will allow, I spoke the last time, and I believe it reached the third reading, and it didn't get out before y'all closed the last session that you had. And with this bill, it would help a lot of farmers because there was a lot of individuals that were speaking with regards to uh, having to pay commercial taxes on their farm stands. And as you well know that uh, 
this year, a lot of the farmers' uh, crops and stuff went under because of flooding and so forth. But that doesn't relieve them from still having to pay the high taxes uh, on their fruit stand. This would benefit the farmers where they would be able to take uh, the number of acres that they need, I believe it's five to qualify under 61A, so that they could get some tax relief. And I appreciate the fact that the last bill had in it where that uh, it would also give the farmers a look back of two years on that bill to be able to go in and submit adjustment and try to get a little bit of the taxes back that they pay commercial wise. This is a bill that will certainly benefit the community because the farmers are trying to bring in healthy food and stuff to the community. And I know for a fact that Gary Farm, I first came to Lilton in 1997. It was the first farm stand that was up that was housed with cover over. However, there's two other farms that's close by that uh, over the years that they have built up and have the same type facilities, but they have plenty of land there that they can qualify under the 61A and they don't have to worry about paying commercial taxes there. The commercial taxes are hurting the farmers and I would like for this committee uh, to move this bill forward, get it on the governor's desk so that she could sign it so it would authorize some relief to our farmers. A lot of the farms, and there are a few now, compared to what it was when I first came out into the Littleton area here. And uh, I know that they could use every bit of any help that they could get from the government, especially with the taxes when you talk about commercial taxes. And I certainly would like to thank each and every one of you for the effort that you're putting in on these bills because we certainly need to see our farmers where they are able to continue to provide quality and healthy food to the community. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you for the opportunity to be able to speak here this morning. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. Any comments or questions from the committee? See none. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Next up, joining us virtually is Keith Bergman. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman and members. And actually, it's a pleasure to follow George Sanders, who was one of my constituents in Littleton when I was town administrator there. So hello, George. Uh, my name is Keith Bergman. I'm a Concord resident and uh, founding co-chair of the Climate Reality Project's Boston Metro chapter, which urges uh, co the committee's favorable action on two bills that would allow individual donations to a Massachusetts fund for vulnerable communities most affected by climate change. Senate 1756, filed by my state senator, Mike Barrett, and House 2721, filed by Representatives Cabral and Barber. And first, let me thank this committee for uh, its uh, action and favorably reporting out both bills in the last two sessions of the legislature. These bills would provide Massachusetts taxpayers with a simple and direct way to support combating the climate crisis around the world by establishing a model for the nation uh, for, uh, by enabling uh, state taxpayer donations to the United Nations Least Developed Countries Fund. Since its creation, LDCF has supported over 365 projects with some 1.7 billion in grants, benefiting over 52 uh, million people in least developed countries. LDCF is also one of the largest uh, portfolios of climate adaptation uh, projects in the international finance community. And these projects are crucial to, uh, to support countries in building resilience to the climate impacts they are already facing. These bills would authorize a voluntary checkoff on personal state income tax returns into a Massachusetts fund to further the mission of the UN's Least Developed Countries Fund. In fact, without this legislation, there is no way for state tax taxpayers to make private donations to the UN's fund. 
but by creating a voluntary checkoff on state tax returns, our residents would be able to contribute directly to those around the world uh, with most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Mass Inc. polling data uh, found that 56% of Massachusetts residents say our state should act ahead of other states in responding to climate change. And a vast majority of our residents, 79%, the poll says, are concerned about the climate crisis. So we urge the committee to report out favorably Senate 1756 and House 2721. And thanks very much for your consideration and your continued support. Thank you. Uh, next up is Jean Ann Ramey. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Vice Chair. My name is Jean Ann Ramey. I live and vote in Cambridge in the Middlesex 29th District. Stephen Owens is my representative, and William Brownsberger is my senator. And I'm here today providing testimony on my own behalf. I've worked in climate change and electricity policy for 30 years. 10 years ago, I founded the nonprofit organization Climable, and Climable does technical translation of the really complex issues that people face on, on um, making decisions about clean energy to support local communities. We work in Chelsea, Chinatown, and with a bunch of Boston communities, as well as in Cambridge. And while our work is not international, we do realize that the work, the, the fossil fuels that we burn here affect global climate change everywhere. So um, today I'm here to voice my support as an individual for House Bill 2721 and Senate Bill 1756. So um, the voluntary, as we just heard, the voluntary checkoff on state tax returns will help most, the most vulnerable communities of the world cope with climate change. And this is a great idea for you to implement this uh, state tax checkoff. It's voluntary. Many people, even most people, want to do something to combat the effects of climate change. And we want our elected leaders to help us do that. And we also know that less developed countries are bearing the brunt of our burning of fossil fuels. Here in Massachusetts, we have benefited from a fossil fuel economy for over 100 years. And we're sitting in one of the richest places in the world. People probably have a little extra money to give, but it's really hard to know how to do it. And by giving the residents of the Commonwealth a trusted pathway to send funds to the international community, to island nations, to people who are less able and can less afford to relocate or to prepare their homes, their communities, and their cities for the difficult effects of climate change, um, you'll be making that a little bit easier by letting us choose how and where to send our money. There's also the question of mechanics. Um, people don't know when their money actually gets there, if they're sending money overseas. And so by having this routine process, paying our taxes, uh, become a channel using the trusted fiscal agents of the Commonwealth and then having them have the direct line to the United Nations fund, we know it's a win-win. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts has always been a leader and this should be no exception. So by you taking this symbolic step, we'll continue to be a model. Of, our state will be a model for other states. Do you have any questions for me? Any comments or questions from the committee? Seeing Thank you none. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is a hybrid panel. Uh, in person is Lindsay Rooney and Beth McGinnis. And virtually is Taylor Milius. Chairwoman Moran, Chairman Cusack, and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Beth McGinnis, and I'm the CEO of the Massachusetts Service Alliance, which serves as the official state service commission for the Commonwealth. I, along with my colleague, Lindsay Rooney, are here to express our strong support for Senate Bill 1890 and House Bill 2777, an act in excluding the Siegel AmeriCorps Education Award from taxable income. 
AmeriCorps members are participants in a national service program where they're paid a very modest living allowance. After completing their year of service, they receive a small education award that can be used for tuition or to pay back uh, student loan debt. For the current program, the 2023-24 uh, program year, uh, the value of this education award for a full-time AmeriCorps member is $6,895. In Massachusetts, this award is treated as taxable income, creating a burden for those who served communities across the state and a disincentive to those who are con considering serving in the program. There are strict federal regulations that dictate how the Siegel Education Award can be used, and because of those requirements, AmeriCorps members never physically receive the funds directly themselves. Instead, the award is transferred directly to institutions of higher ed or to federal student loan servicers. Even though AmeriCorps members never deposit these education awards in their own bank accounts, the funds are still taxed as regular income when they are redeemed. So upon completing their year of service, many AmeriCorps members do not have the disposable income to pay taxes on this education award because they are paid a minimum living stipend during their service term. The 935 AmeriCorps members serving in programs supported by Massachusetts Service Alliance will incur a tax liability from their education award. Based on the current enrollment, this is an estimated annual revenue of $240,000 for the state based on the $4.8 million in education awards that the members will be eligible to receive. This tax revenue represents a small fraction of total tax receipts. However, the impact and the tax burden on the individual with, with limited resources is significant. The Education Award is one of the greatest incentives for individuals to commit to a year of service with AmeriCorps. However, some members refrain from redeeming their award because of the tax burden. Removing the state tax on these funds would make Massachusetts an attractive place for AmeriCorps members to serve and to stay to use their Ed Award. This policy change would also bolster AmeriCorps member recruitment and in turn increase the impact of the program in the state. In Massachusetts, there are 935 members serving in programs supported by us. Those members provide almost 1.2 million hours of service each year, which is worth an estimated $37.5 million in value. This service is invaluable to the state and removing the tax on the Ed Award would only help the program to grow. Removing the state tax on the Siegel Education Award in Massachusetts will strengthen the overall AmeriCorps program, remove financial burdens of those who have served, and ensure its intended act um, by the creation of the award. In closing, we are asking the committee to report favorably on this bill. Thank you again for this opportunity. The MSA is ready and available to work with you and your staff on this important legislation and to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Taylor. Oh, and then Taylor. Oh, Taylor, yes. Okay, um, hello. Thank you, Chairwoman Moran, Chairman Kusick, and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Taylor Russell Milius, and I'm here today to share my personal experience as an AmeriCorps alumna from 2013 through 2015, so I served two years, and to express my strong interest, uh, my strong support for Senate Bill uh, 1890, House Bill 2777, an act excluding the Siegel AmeriCorps Education Award from taxable income. AmeriCorps was a transformational experience for me. Uh, I dedicated two years of my life to serving my community, uh, working tirele tirelessly to address critical needs and make a meaningful impact in Boston Public Schools. Um, in return for my service, I received the Siegel AmeriCorps Education Award, which was a vital resource that I plan to use to pursue graduate education um, here in Boston at Boston University and can uh, further contribute to society. However, I was not adequately really informed or prepared for the unexpected financial burden that awaited me when tax season arrived. Um, to my dismay, I discovered that this valuable education award was considered taxable income. With my very modest AmeriCorps stipend, I was not able to set aside the funds to pay the taxes associated with the award. The realization left me in a really difficult situation, struggling to make ends meet while also trying to fulfill my commitment to repay the taxes incurred. Um, the AmeriCorps program encourages individuals to engage in community service and gives them a pathway to higher education. By making the Seagull Ameri uh, AmeriCorps Education Award taxable, the financial burden placed on AmeriCorps alumni is counterproductive and to the program's core values of community service and education. 
Um, Senate Bill 1890, House Bill 2777 offers a solution to this issue. It seeks to exclude the Seagull AmeriCorps Education Award from taxable income. By passing this bill, you have the power to remove a significant financial obstacle that many AmeriCorps alumni like myself face after completing their service. Excluding this award from taxation would not only alleviate undue financial strain, but would also promote education and career advancement among AmeriCorps alumni. It would promote individuals like me with the opportunity to use this award for its intended purpose, which is investing in our education and furthering our contributions to our communities and our country. In conclusion, I urge, urge the members of the Revenue Committee to support Senate Bill 1890, House Bill 2777. Your support will not only benefit AmeriCorps alumni, but will also strengthen the mission of AmeriCorps and promote the values of public service and education. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Vice Chair Linsky. Just um, how much are these awards? So for an individual who does full-time service, um, the education award is $6,895 currently. Um, it's indexed to the Pell, Grant, the Pell Grant. So as the Pell Grant goes up, the full-time education award goes up. If they do less than full-time service, then it's proportional. Exactly. And we're just asking for this bill to be treated just like the GI Bill and just like the Pell Grants where they're not taxed. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? No. Oh, thank you very much. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Next up is Liz Rickley. Liz? Hello. Hi. Um, Good morning. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Liz Rickley and I am a policy analyst at the Conservation Law Foundation. And my background before CLF was environmental policy and urban planning. And at CLF, I work on the Healthy Resilient Communities team, where we work to build healthy and equitable communities in Massachusetts and throughout New England. I'm here today to ask the committee to favorably report H2852 and act to promote urban agriculture and horticulture through an optional property tax exemption for small scale commercial urban agriculture. This bill addresses two challenges facing urban farmers, one, the high cost of land and two, the uneven distribution of benefits between rural and urban farmers in Massachusetts. Urban farmers help communities across Massachusetts thrive. They expand access to healthy food, create green space, connect community members, and more. Urban farmers in Western Massachusetts have transformed vacant lots into productive community spaces, expanding their community's access to fresh, affordable food. In the Berkshires, urban farmers partnered with the community to respond to heightened food insecurity throughout the pandemic. And in Boston, urban farmers invite community members to share meals, learn about eco-conscious practices, and what was once just an overgrown vacant lot. And these examples just began to scratch the surface. But despite all that they do for their communities, high land prices prevent many urban farmers from even getting started in Massachusetts. And even those that are able to access land may struggle to keep it under the daunting burden of high property taxes. This bill creates an optional property tax exemption for small scale commercial urban agriculture. Cities can voluntarily adopt the exemption and determine its extent up to 100%. This exemption would reduce or remove the burden of high property taxes, making land access and long-term land tenure more feasible for urban farmers. Unlike rural farms, urban farms almost never benefit from Chapter 61A due to its five-acre minimum size requirement. We see H2852 as providing parity for small-scale productive farmers, many of whom are people of color, immigrants, or refugees. This bill is intended to support urban farmers for whom property-related taxes are the most burdensome, a group that tends to manage smaller tracts of land. Farmers that manage land no more than two acres in size for commercial agriculture would be eligible. If this bill passes, we expect urban farmers' operations and their associated benefits to steadily increase throughout Massachusetts. As with other states that have passed similar legislation, we expect levels of participation from urban farmers that are very manageable, manageable for the participating cities. By lowering a key barrier to urban agriculture, we also expect stronger and more resilient local food systems to grow. Again, I encourage the committee to favorably report this bill. Um, I welcome any questions. We'll also be submitting written testimony and thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Liz, any comments or questions from the committee? 
Seeing none, thank you. Uh, next up virtually is Fred Rose. Hello, um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity for speaking uh, today. Um, following the previous comments, I'm speaking in favor of passage of House Bill 2852, which is the act to support urban agriculture and horticulture to create an agricultural tax structure for small urban farms. This will enable farms in high poverty communities like Springfield, where I work, to create jobs and provide access to fresh local produce to, for our communities. I am here representing Wellspring Harvest, which is an urban uh, greenhouse located in Springfield. We believe we are the largest for-profit urban greenhouse in Massachusetts. We grow hydroponic lettuce and sell to commercial and institutional customers. Wellspring Harvest is a worker cooperative that provides jobs and wealth for low-income city residents who would not have access to good-paying jobs otherwise. Wellspring Harvest reclaimed a blighted 1.7-acre brownfield site that we purchased from the Springfield Redevelopment Authority. The old industrial site had become a blighted urban lot and a source of crime and drug use. By redeveloping an old industrial site, we inherited an industrial tax rate, which is the highest tax rate in our city. The industrial tax rate is $36.40. This is the rate set for high revenue commercial and industrial companies, but this industrial rate is unafford unaffordable for farming. The net farm income per acre in Massachusetts, according to the most recent census of agriculture is $7,859 per acre. Wellspring is paying $9,899 per acre in property taxes a year. These taxes are higher than the net income per acre in Massachusetts. No farm in the state could survive paying this industrial tax rate. If our farm buying land was assessed using 61A, our taxes would decline, decline to about $102. This is a rate that other farms in the state are paying. We should be able to do the same. The current definition of a farm is five acres of land, which is not available in dense urban areas. Thus, cities like Springfield do not have an agricultural tax rate that they can charge for farms like us. This is an enormous barrier to urban agriculture that could be providing jobs and fresh produce in our urban areas. Passing this bill to create a more fair tax rate for urban farms would make an enormous contribution to expanding agriculture in our cities. We urge you to provide this tax relief for us at Wellspring Harvest and for other urban farms. Thank you, Fred. Any comments or questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have an in-person panel, Lisa Evans, Thea Keen, and Ryan Riley. Hi, I'm Lisa Evans. I am the co-owner of We Grow Microgreens. Uh, we Grow Microgreens is a small commercial urban farm um, it is owned by myself and Tim Smith, and it specializes in growing highly nutritious microgreens, edible flowers, tea leaves, medicinal plants, and herbs using sustainable and regenerative growing practices. The farm operates out of a 4,600 square foot glass greenhouse, two high tunnels, and 100 raised garden beds on approximately one acre of land in Hyde Park, which is a section of the city of Boston. We are using predominantly natural sunlight, potting soil, and raised garden beds for growing. What makes us unique is that our plants are grown with natural sunlight. Our sunshine grown microgreens and herbs are available to, to consumers within hours of harvest. Our greenhouse is energy efficient, water conserving, we have a condensing boiler, flood benches, an insulated foundation, translucent solar panels, a shade curtain, roof fence, and an energy efficient heating system. We also collect rainwater off our roof. Additionally, we educate consumers and chefs about the nutritional value of microgreens, flowers, and medicinal plants, 
and we also engage in educating local youth and provide them with jobs. Our strengths are that we're located in the city of Boston and we have access to amazing talent for employees through the area universities and high schools. Uh, our weaknesses that are that we are new and we're still learning the agricultural business. Um, commercial urban farming is new for the city of Boston and there are metal, many hurdles to overcome with politics, neighbors, and permitting. Um, small scale, as small scale farmers, we can't tap into the economies of scale and we also can't expand our footprint. Uh, our strength is also that we have access to local restaurants, access to local farmers markets, um, and as a farm versus a housing development project, we use fewer city services such as emergency services and schools. The threats that we face as an urban farm is development next to our farm could potentially cast shadows on the farm and on our farm solar panels. We endured three lawsuits to protect our land from development um, next to it that would have cast shadows on the farm and on our solar panels. We also have a high price of labor to complete any construction project. Permitting is a very complex in the city of Boston and we have no relief from zoning which is afforded to farms over two acres. Uh, chapter 61A permits farmland um, over five acres to be assessed at its current use value rather than its development value. Uh, this bill extends benefits to small scale urban farms like ours and we'll be able to take advantage of the same benefits that are afforded to suburban and rural farner, farmers that are over five acres. Uh, for this same reason we also support the current efforts underway to amend the Massachusetts Constitution to lower the minimum acreage requirement of 61A. Uh, because agricultural land provides valuable public benefits and requires fewer costly town services or city services, um, the Chapter 61A program offers a property tax break for landowners willing to commit to keeping some or all their land undeveloped for a specific period of time. Um, Please note that Massachusetts has the highest cost of production in the country for agricultural commodities. The tax burden that we bear uh, is, significant, is a significant part of our budget. Lowering the tax burden would be a positive change. It would put us on par with farms that are over five acres. It would help keep agriculture, specifically urban agriculture, alive in Massachusetts. All agriculture in Massachusetts is, as, is at risk because it is not financially feasible. Um, the acreage of an average farm in Massachusetts is 60 acres. In Illinois, it's 100. We are approximately 0.8 acres, so just under one acre. Um, cost of doing business in Massachusetts is significant and is an obstacle to people who want to be involved in agriculture and continue to be involved. Um, not being able to partake in 61A acreage threshold is an obstacle. We view urban ag as part and parcel in this region going forward. Anything to make it more accessible and, ap and appealing is important. Similar to how the state supports artists with housing, urban farming needs to be supported as well with this tax break. Um, Rather than being assessed at its development value, land enrolled in Chapter 61A is assessed for its agricultural use. Agricultural assessment values are set annual, annually by the Farmland Valuation Advisory Commission, a state appointed commission, and are based on the estimated market value of agricultural products the land is capable of producing. Chapter 61 programs offer a property tax break for landowners willing to commit to keeping some or all of their land undeveloped for a specific period of time. Our land currently holds an agricultural deed restriction. I am more, I am more than familiar with the economic challenges of making a commercial go of it as an urban farmer. 
um, than most as we started our urban farm out of our backyard in Rosendale and then in 2019 acquired just under an acre of land from the city of Boston for urban farming. This land holds an agricultural deed restriction. Obviously, we can't grow corn and compete with someone in Iowa. If, if the city of Boston is going to have locally grown food, it will need to support local urban farmers financially. And part of this would be to give them not only a tax break, um, this would help give us predictability and reliability in our budget. It is a way for Boston to support their urban farmers and one never knows when that might be important, such as during a pandemic. Currently, we are in the process in arguing about taxes with the city of Boston. Each year, we have to file an abatement and have to pay consultant fees and attorney fees to do this. Local governments are unsure of how to tax urban farms. I have disputed some of our tax years. Um, Boston could come up with a rate similar to Chapter 61A, which would give us, a ta give us their tax predictability. I filed for an abatement, and I have had some meetings with the City of Boston's tax assessors, with my lawyer, and other experts. Uh, we are meeting in February. Again, um, we're going in front of the appellate tax board. This is going to be a costly endeavor. It's going to require expert witnesses and consultants and lawyer fees, as well as a large burden on our time and taking me away from our mission of growing food. Uh, this is both an economic hit, hit and a time sink. I, I will have to prepare all sorts of documents for this meeting um, and appearance before the appellate tax board. Even if this bill is adopted tomorrow, I will still have to go through these proceedings before the appellate tax board. Boston doesn't have a farm rate, so our farm is getting charged a commercial rate. If they adopted a reasonable farm rate, then I would not have to argue that a farm should, pay a, should have to pay a commercial rate. Ideally, this would just follow 61A so that there is equity amongst farms regardless of our size. Thank you. Thank you. I'll switch it. Hello, my name is Thea Keen, and I'm a student at Northeastern U University, and I'm interning at We Grow Microgreens. Um, as mentioned, this is an urban farm located in Hyde Park, which is right in like in the section of the city of Boston. We Grow Microgreens is a for-profit commercial urban farm located on a little less than an acre of land. Article 89 allows for commercial farming in the city of Boston at all sizes with conditional use for farms greater than one acre. When you look at the farms in Boston, you'll realize that we are only one of four farms that are commercial. We fortunately own our approximately one acre plot. The other two farms are on lease land in Allendale Farm farm falls under chapter 61A because it is over five acres. The other 13 farms are nonprofit, thus not paying real estate taxes. Farming is a very difficult endeavor in the first place. We're all aware that urban farming has its own set of challenges, with land being very hard to come by, and when farmers are able to come by it, it's almost never in five acre plots. As we all know, this makes it wildly expensive to own and operate since our land is not being taxed as farmland but as commercial land. For-profit urban farms more often than not are not viable financially and therefore farmers go the nonprofit route, avoiding the burden of paying real estate taxes on land that should be taxed as farmland. If this bill gets adopted by Boston, it is logical to expect the same trend in other urban areas throughout the state. Um, oh, sorry. If this bill um, is adopted in Boston and, and country as a county and state, we should be encouraging urban farms. We should recognize the importance of urban, farm, urban farming for their environmental impact in the ways it strengthens and uplifts communities. For-profit urban farms need to be a viable option for farmers and the passing of this bill will result in that. We Grow Microgreens not only is a commercial farm, but it is also a minority owned business. One of our owners, Tim Smith, is part of the 1.3% of black farmers who own land in the United States and part of the 0.42% of black farmers who own land in Massachusetts. There are only 27 black farmland owners in Massachusetts. These numbers are a result of 
years of damage to black farming community with biases regarding land ownership laws, societal pressures, loan services, and countless other facets. The USDA actually faced a class action lawsuit against them in 1999 due to the discrimination they showed against black farmers, resulting in an uneven distribution of loans and support. As we know, most urban settings have a much higher concentration of people of color, and therefore this is the demographic that is disproportionately affected by the lack of urban farms. The taxation of farms under five acres directly impacts urban communities because it means that it is unlikely a farmer would establish a farm in these areas. As a result, this means there are potentially less urban farms and in turn less access to fresh produce for these minorities. Farms like We Grow Microgreens are doing what, we, what they can to start a farm and be successful with whatever amount of land is available. And the current tax laws against it is just another way of making it um, almost impossible to succeed and in turn not allowing minorities access to healthy food and fresh produce. This bill is incredibly important to pass so that farms of all sizes are taxed for what they are, farms, and that all communities can benefit from having a farm as part of the, in part of their area. Thank you. Hello everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. My name is Ryan Riley, and I'm an intern from Northeastern University at Wego Microgreens. I am here today to offer my support for House Bill 2853 and Senate Bill 1855 that would grant tax exemptions, specifically property tax exemptions, to urban farms within Massachusetts. This initiative is not just about providing financial relief for urban farms. It is about nurturing a sustainable, resilient, regenerative, and vibrant community. Urban farming has become an integral part of Boston's fabric, addressing critical issues such as food security, environmental sustainability, and community engagement. These small urban farms work tirelessly to offer fresh, locally grown produce to their communities, reducing our carbon footprint and contributing to healthier living for Boston residents. Currently, our farm is working with Grow Boston, Boston's urban agricultural department, to address the issue of food insecurity through a grant to build 60 raised garden beds for low-income Boston residents. Projects such as these highlight the importance of urban farms to their communities. By granting tax exemptions to urban farms within the city of Boston, we're not only recognizing the invaluable service they provide, but also encouraging the growth of urban agriculture within our city. This not only promotes self-sufficiency, but also fosters a sense of community that is often lacking in our fast-paced, modern urban lives. Moreover, supporting such initiatives aligns with our environmental goals, reducing food miles, promoting green spaces, and enhancing the overall quality of life in our city. Boston's urban farms are leading the way in sustainable agriculture, setting an example for other urban areas to follow. With the passing of this bill, urban farms will recognize greater financial stability and in turn will have the ability to reach more residents of Boston, resulting in more sustainable and healthier communities. Localized agriculture is the way of the future, and I urge you all to stand with me in support of this bill and recognize the immense value that urban farms bring into our community. Thank you all. Thank you. Any comments or questions from the committee? Oh, get off easy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have an eight-person panel, seven virtually, but I'll take Rick Rabin, or Rabin first, since you're in person, Rick. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Richard Rabin, and I'm here to support HB 2812 and SB 1837. Uh, I'm from the, representing the Massachusetts Coalition for Occupational Safety and Health. Um, I personally have worked with farm workers for m many years, um, both in Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, California, and so I have a pretty good idea of their farm workers' um, living and, and working conditions. Um, and, and 
really what I want to do here today is appeal to your and our collective humanity towards uh, farm workers. Um, they're regular people. They're people who have families. They have lives outside of work. They have expenses. Um, but they've been historically treated in a, unfortunately, a very racist kind of way, uh, economic discrimination. And this bill um, will address some of that um, problem. Um, just like everybody else, they deserve to have a, um, a, a minimum wage, the same minimum wage as everyone else, same with overtime pay. Um, and paid time off, time to spend with their families for, habit, for hobbies, to be a part of their community. They're, just, they're not asking to be treated any differently than anyone else. Um, and particularly with climate change, um, it's important that they be given time while they're working for a little time to have a break, both in the morning and in the afternoon. It's really not too much to ask. So again, I, th I think it's time that Massachusetts uh, treated farm workers just like they treat, it, treat the rest of the workforce. Thanks. Thank you, Rick. Thomas, you Seeing none, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, joining us virtually is Claudia Quintero, William Newman. Uh, Virginia Benzin. Hi, good morning, um, members of the committee. My name is Claudia Quintero, and I am a staff attorney at Central West Justice Center, which is the legal aid organization here in Springfield, Massachusetts, which provides direct civil legal services to um, indigent clients, including farm workers. I'm also a law professor at Western New England School of Law, and I lead the Fairness for Farm Workers Coalition. Um, thank you all for taking the time to hear our testimony this morning. Uh, I'm testifying in support of H. 2812 and S. 1837, an act establishing fairness for agricultural laborers. First, we'd like to thank Senator Gomez and Representative Carlos Gonzalez for filing this important legislation. Um, in my practice, I've been representing, I've represented hundreds of farm workers and across the state in various industries. And the common refrain that I have heard is the desire to be dignified in, with a fair wage. Currently under Massachusetts wage law, farm workers are entitled to legally make as little as $8 an hour. And both under federal and state law are exempt entirely from overtime pay. In this time and age, with inflation, farm workers can barely afford to buy the very foods that they harvest at the grocery store. Many of the workers are seasonal. Uh, in peak season is usually April to November, and many struggle with basic necessities during the winter months. We have approximately 13,000 farm workers in Massachusetts, many of whom are um, migrant workers, uh, black and brown workers in Massachusetts, and of the around seven to 800 farms, about a third of them hire farm workers. I recognize that farmers are hard hit as well, and we just heard testimony from, other, uh, from farmers talking about other aspects of their industry. And as we've heard from growers, no farm is the same, which is why our bill, um, the, through our bill, the Fairness for Farm Workers Coalition is proposing a tax credit that would help offset the increased cost of overtime. Sister states like New York and Oregon have already implemented such a tax credit. And as we don't believe that the cost should be on the back of farm workers um, earning as little as $8. Um, yes, we know that there are farmers that pay more, but generally many are making under the state minimum wage of $15 an hour. The state has an obligation to help all of its residents, especially those that cultivate the very foods that we eat. We are, uh, we've been working with the Political Economy Research Institute at UMass Amherst to do analysis and determine what this looks like um, 
in terms of cost. And what we have found through our analysis is that Massachusetts is fifth in the state as a direct to consumer seller. And we are top three um, pr uh, producer of cranberries in Massachusetts. So our tax credit proposes up to a 50% credit to producers, um, farmers, growers. Um, a larger credit would go to smaller farms and by smaller, we are looking at USDA data to determine farms that hire between one and two um, farm workers and a smaller credit would go to larger farms that uh, produce and generate larger revenues and hire uh, larger numbers of farm workers. Um, the tax credit based on our calculations would increase, well, the general overtime costs would increase labor costs by about no more than 2% for farmers. Um, so we definitely want the committee to consider our proposal. We've been working on this issue for a long time. We've been very intentional about our analysis and working with experts uh, to consider what this bill could look like. We've been in conversation with sister states across the country to see what could be a good fit for Massachusetts. But at the end of the day, it shouldn't really be the farm workers who have to suffer the consequences of the larger issues affecting the agricultural industry and growers' ability to make a profit and generate revenue um, at the expense of farmers, farm workers who can't afford the very food that they cultivate in our state. So thank you again for your time. And I look forward to um, any questions. And of course, we ask you to please report these bills out favorably. Thank you. Claudia. William Newman. Bill, you're muted. There should be like an icon at the top of your screen there. Is that better? That is now. <laughs> Thank you. Excuse my technological ineptness. Um, uh, my name is William Newman, and I am the supervising attorney for the Western Massachusetts Office of the ACLU of Massachusetts. The ACLU of Massachusetts is part of the Fairness for Farm Workers Coalition, and I am here today to urge the committee to report favorably on H2812 and S1837. I would try to make this clear. There's an enormous unfairness in the Commonwealth. And that's why I come before the committee today to ask you to do all within your legislative power to remedy that unfairness by reporting favorably the act, establishing fairness for agricultural laborers. The underlying proposition for this legislation is straightforward. Most hourly workers in Massachusetts are guaranteed a minimum wage of $15 an hour. Farm workers, workers who as the pandemic made abundantly clear are essential workers, are guaranteed a sub-minimum wage of $8 an hour. That's the law. $15 for virtually everybody except farm workers who get $8 an hour. And what needs to be said about this? What needs to be acknowledged? is that most farm workers are people of color. This discrimination against farm workers based on race has deep historical resonance. The reason that farm workers were initially omitted from federal minimum wage laws was because the Roosevelt administration had to make a deal with Southern Democratic segregationist senators whose votes were essential 
to having the legislation passed. At that time, in the South, most farm workers were black. What we experience today with the subminimum wage for farm workers is a vestige of Jim Crow. In 2023 in Massachusetts, I would urge and I would hope most would agree that that is unacceptable. $8 an hour. Few jobs require the skill and stamina and physical endurance of farm workers, as well as the skill and speed involved in picking and harvesting. The difficulty in bending over hour after hour, what is required to be in the sun in 90 degree or higher temperature days, hour after hour, day after day. And for all of that, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts says we will guarantee farm workers are essential workers in 2023, $8 an hour. A subminimum wage that is 53% of the minimum wage for everyone else. Why is that okay? I would urge that it is not. Hourly workers in Massachusetts earn time and a half after 40 hours. But what do these seasonal farm workers get for overtime when they work 50 hours a week? Nothing. Or 60 hours a week? nothing or 70 hours a week nothing and what about earned time off a guaranteed day of rest again none these are the essential workers who we have lauded for what they give to all of us what they contribute to our economy what they contribute to our commonwealth but then we have failed to protect them with our labor laws there is an enormous injustice in this state. And it is time, I urge that it is past time to remedy this injustice, this inequality, this discrimination. Before the committee is a thoughtful and critically analyzed piece of legislation to which Claudia Quintero has alluded and made specific reference. And made specific reference to the experiences of other states that have passed and enacted and are using similar legislation. I urge that the time to end the discrimination is now. And I thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you, Bill. Any comments or questions? Yeah. Hi, if I may ask you, um, what percentage of these agricultural workers are um, in the country with a temporary visa to do agricultural work? Um, do you hear the question? I'm sorry, I did my, not. My question was, do you know what percentage of these agricultural workers are in the country, or in Massachusetts, with a temporary visa to perform, to perform agricultural work. Do you know the percentage? Yes, it's about 5%, I believe, and Claudia could give it to you exactly, but it's about 5% uh, of workers in Massachusetts. 5% of the workers that are doing agricultural work Agri are uh, come from one country? Agricultural workers in Massachusetts. No, that's not my question. My question is, what percentage of those agricultural workers are, in the con are here with a temporary visa to perform agricultural work? I don't know that I can tell you that for the country in Massachusetts. I can say it's about but, 5 percent. It's about a third. Um, about a third of agricultural workers. Of the 13,000, about a third of them are here on an H-2A visa. Okay. So when, when you understand when they went to apply for the visa, they knew how much they were going to get paid to perform this work. And also that they, because they are in a temporary visa, they never acquire a citizenship of the state of Massachusetts. So basically, they are no resident of our state. Actually, that's a really good point, um, uh, committee member. The, the concern is less with the folks who have H-2A visas and more with our domestic workers who will reside and live in Massachusetts. Under the H-2A laws, which are governed by the federal government, uh, agricultural workers who come to Massachusetts to work on our farms actually make $16 and 90 something cents. So they are exempt from the sub minimum wage per their contract. They have to make 
at least the $16 and change, and they're also guaranteed a certain number of hours. Um, so they're actually not as affected by these laws as our domestic workers who live and work in Massachusetts, who are not coming on these H-2A visas. Do you believe the you don't, do you, do you you don't believe that there is change on compensation we put uh, Massachusetts agriculture or farmers in a disadvantage in the, uh, for them to be able to get employees and be able to, to, be, to compete um, because once it costs more for them to produce. Um, the, the, we ended up paying more when we go to the, to the supermarket. Do you, you don't believe that this is gonna put Massachusetts farmer in a disadvantaged position because it's gonna, be, uh, it's gonna require them to spend more money uh, to produce the product? Well, it would cost them more money in the sense that they will be paying more potentially in overtime, um, which is why we're proposing a tax credit in that regard to help offset so that they correct can compete in the market with other farms but new york which is right next to which is in the northeast has already implemented a 40 hour uh, overtime law which farmers will be should be paying overtime after 40. our bill proposes overtime after 55 hours for seasonal workers and 40 for year-round workers like any other worker new york's law is overtime for 40 for all workers, and they're already offering a tax credit to help. So it is not, it wouldn't be a new thing in our region and in other states like Maine and Vermont, they are already having these same conversations. So I think that Massachusetts taking the lead would allow other, other states to sort of follow as well because they want to, but they also have these same concerns. Um, the other thing is guaranteeing minimum wage, I think, is important, um, an important part of the conversation. I don't think that farmers are going to go out of business or not be able to compete because they're paying minimum wage to farm workers. Um, Thank you. Well, we're saying most of these workers also have housing uh, where, where they work. And if we impute housing and where they get paid and with the cost of housing, it would be more than the minimum wage right now in Massachusetts. And what I've been hearing about how the farmers are struggling with property taxes, I really should consider if increasing the cost of, of personnel will be in the best interest of the agricultural industry in San Francisco. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Any other comments or questions? Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Virginia Benton. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you today. Uh, I also wanted to just add on to Claudia's um, comments that in addition to New York, Washington, Oregon, and Colorado have similar legislation about the tax credit. Um, so even though Massachusetts can lead, we'd also be following other states with bigger and larger um, farm populations. Um, but good afternoon and uh, Chair and Vice Chair and members of the Joint Committee on Revenue. Uh, I am Virginia Ben's son and I direct the Race Equity and Justice Project at the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute, and I am a proud member of the Fairness for Farm Workers Coalition. So I testify today um, in conjunction with the support of uh, my colleagues uh, in support of an act establishing fairness for agricultural workers, uh, 1837 and 2012. And I say, uh, today I'm gonna focus my comments on so that we can acknowledge and understanding the history of the exclusion of agricultural workers from our labor legislation. Um, it is an integral tool to advancing racial justice in our labor laws to understand our history. And so in November of, 19, of 1887, our country experienced one of the bloodiest days of our labor history when 60 African-American Southern farm workers were murdered and their bodies dumped in an unmarked grave after attempting to organize for better wages and conditions. Days after a white resident wrote, I think this is where we will settle the question of who is to rule, the N-word or the white man for the next 50 years. This prediction was eerily accurate. 50 years later in 1938, Southern white leaders sought to hold on to their rule 
by insisting on the exclusion of agricultural and domestic labor categories of employment uh, dominated by Black Americans from labor protections and empowerment in the New Deal legislation. They understood and intended to exclude agricultural workers from their labor protections in order to maintain the Southern racial order and to protect Jim Crow law, life, which we know was not very dissimilar from slave life in the South. And during the Fair Labor Standards Act debates, a Southern representative said, there is another matter of great importance in the South, and that is the problem of our Negro labor. There has always been a difference in the wage scale of white and colored labor. So long as Florida people are permitted to handle the matter, the delicate and perplexing problem can be adjusted. But the federal government knows no color line and of a necessity, it cannot make any distinction between the races. We may rest assured therefore, that when we turn over to the federal bureau or board the power to fix wages, it will prescribe the same wage for the Negro that it prescribes for the white man. Now such a plan might work in some sections in the United States, but those of us who know the true situation know that it is just will not work in the South. You cannot put the Negro and the white man on the same basis and get away with it. This was a common sentiment in the debates. And though it is not the only reason the New Deal passed, it is a central part of why it did. The Congress, congressional legislative history and related scholarship clearly demonstrate that without a doubt, the exemptions from the Fair Labor Standards Act's provisions related to overtime and minimum wage protections for agricultural workers were not based on legitimate grounds, not based on concerns about cost to the farmers, not based on legitimate grounds based on uh, increasing the price of produce but based on a desire to continue the subjugation of black Americans. The question that an act establishing fairness for agricultural workers raises today is whether we want this racist legacy to continue or whether it's time to finally rid our books of discriminatory laws. This exclusion is not unfortunate or, un or an unintended consequence. The exclusion was purposeful. So I ask that you support an act establishing fairness for agricultural workers and to end this discriminatory practice. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Virginia. Any comments or questions? Professor Virginia Benson, thank you. Uh, for me, it's an honor to say hi to you. I learned with you to, to fight for the right of immigrants like me in this country. And I feel you know how I feel to be in this committee and <coughs> we wish you are presented on um, advocating for and it's, uh, and honestly, I'm so proud to see you up there. It's so great to see you. As your student, I learned a lot. And I believe um, uh, I will prom I promise to give all my consideration to this bill. I know how much you love to advocate for everybody in this country. And I learned to be an advocate because of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Claudia, are we joined by the farm workers? Yes, they're right here with me. Okay. So, you're going to introduce okay. them? Sure. Um, first, we'll start with uh, Manny. I will be translating for them, so they'll be giving a short phrase and then I'll translate. So, okay. Buenas tardes, miembros del comité. Mi nombre es Manuel. Soy de Centroamérica y trabajo como trabajador agrícola en el oeste de Massachusetts. Durante los últimos dos años, hoy testifico a favor de la ley H2812. S1837, porque me permitirá un salario justo y digno. Uh, good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Manuel. I'm from Central America, and I've worked as a farm worker in the western part of Massachusetts uh, for the last two years. I testified today in paper of H2012-S1837, which will allow me a just and dignified uh, wage. 
tengo 21 años, en lugar de ir a la escuela, tengo que trabajar para ayudar a mi familia a pagar mis gastos propios, quisiera ahorrar para ir al colegio, era difícil. En los dos años que trabajo en los campos de Massachusetts, he cultivado berenjena, calabaza, presa y otros productos. Es un trabajo difícil, incluso para alguien de mi edad. Aún así trabajo duro, porque sé que nuestro trabajo provee la comida para la gente de Massachusetts. El trabajo que hacemos es muy importante, pero nos pagan como si no lo fuera. Solo me pagan 13 por hora y trabajo pocas horas. Yo no puedo ahorrar con tan pocos salarios. Quisiera ganar más para cumplir mis metas de estudiar. I'm 21 years old. Instead of going to college, I have to work to provide for my family, pay my own expenses. I wish I could save to go to college, but it's hard. In the last two years that I've worked on the farms in Massachusetts, I've cultivated uh, eggplants, squash, strawberries, and other produce. It's hard work, including for somebody like myself. Still, I work hard because I know that our work provides food to the people of Massachusetts. The work that I do is important, but, it, but I don't get paid as if it's important. They only pay me $13 an hour and I work very few hours. And I can't save with such little money, and I wish I could earn more so that I could accomplish my goals of going to college. Como trabajadores agrícolas, nos tratan de manera diferente. Ganamos poco y no hay tantas protecciones. Con la lluvia que pasaron, pero perdí alrededor de la mitad de mis horas de trabajo, aunque los dueños de los campos recibieron dinero del gobierno. Yo no recibí nada. Si me hubiesen pagado al menos 15 dólares, como la mayoría de los trabajadores en, en este estado, el impacto de inundaciones hubiera sido menor. Um, as farm workers, we are treated differently. We earn little and there's not enough protections. With the recent floods that occurred here in Western Mass, in Western Mass I lost about half of my work hours. Uh, although the owners of the farm received money from the government, I didn't receive anything. If I had earned at least $15 an hour, like the rest of Massachusetts workers in this state, the impact of the floods would have been less. Les pido que voten a favor del proyecto de ley. Hacerlo me permitirá sustentarme y ahorrar para un día poder ir al colegio. Gracias. I ask that you please vote in favor of this bill. Doing so would allow me to sustain myself and save money so that I can one day go to college. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we'll have um, Ma Ma Marilyn Marie. Hi, Buenos días, señor presidente. Mi nombre es Marilyn. Este es mi primer año trabajando en el campo planto y cosecho calabazas, chiles rojos, papas y hoy testifico a favor de la ley H2812 S1837 por, por darnos un salario igual ayudará a que nos traten por igual en las damas Good morning I'm members of the committee, my name is Marilyn, this is my first uh, year working in the farms I plant and harvest squash uh, red peppers and potatoes Today I testify in favor of the law H2812 S 1837 so that I can have a just wage and be treated equally on the farms. Como trabajadora agrícola, trabajo duro todos los días agachada durante muchas horas. Me duele el cuerpo solo para brindar alimentos a la gente de Massachusetts. Aún así, soy discriminada. Todos los días porque soy una trabajadora agrícola latina migrante. Nos dicen que usemos el baño en el monte sin las instalaciones adecuadas. Aunque soy mujer, me obligan a hacer el mismo trabajo que los hombres. Más de una vez me he lastimado la espalda cosechando calabazas perejenas porque el trabajo es demasiado difícil. As a farm worker, I work really hard every day, bent over during many hours. My body hurts um, to provide food to the people of Massachusetts. Still, 
I feel like I'm discriminated um, because I'm a farm worker who is a Latina. They tell me that I have to use the restroom in the woods. We don't have proper uh, bathroom facilities. Although I'm a woman, I'm forced to do the same work as men carrying heavy things. Um, more than once I've heard my back cultivating potatoes, eggplants, uh, because the work is really hard. Otros trabajadores del campo no hacen el mismo trabajo que nosotras las latinas hacemos. Hacen, hacen trabajos más fáciles y les pagan más. Este año gané un salario de 14 dólares por hora. ¿Cómo es justo que yo gane menos que el salario mínimo estatal, menos que otros trabajadores que hacen trabajos más fáciles, trabajos que a, a mí no me dejan hacer? Y es por eso que me siento discriminada. I've seen other farm workers on the farm that don't do the same work that I do as a Latina. They do work that is easier and they get paid more. This year I earned $14 an hour. How is it fair that I earn less than minimum wage, less than other workers that do easier work than me? I feel discriminated. Cuando llegaron las inundaciones, paré de trabajar 75 horas, apenas trabajo 30 horas a la semana. El Estado dio 20 millones de dólares en ayuda a los agricultores. No recibí ningún dinero de, ni bonificación para, para ayudar con mis horas perdidas. A pesar de que yo gano menos, menos que la mayoría de este, la mayoría de este Estado, Con mi compa como mi compañera también soy madre, ¿cómo se supone que voy a cuidar a mis hijos con tan pocas horas, tan pocos salarios y con un gobierno que siempre se olvida de mí? When the floods came, I was working 75 hours, but I stopped working 75 and now I only work 30 hours a week. The state gave uh, farmers around $20 million, but I didn't receive any money or any pay to help me recover the wages for my lost hours. Although I earn less than most workers in this state. Like one of my work, um, co-workers, I'm also a mother. How am I supposed to take care of my kids with such few hours, with such little wage, and with a government that seems to forget about me? Y es por eso que les pido de favor que voten a favor del proyecto de la ley. Es su responsabilidad asegurarse de que todos reciban el mismo trato porque ese es el valor fundamental de este país. Gracias. This is why I ask you to vote in favor of this bill. It's your responsibility to assure that all workers are treated the same in this state as this is a fundamental right of this country. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one, one last um, farm worker, Patricia. Hola, buenos días, miembros del comité. Mi nombre es Patricia. He sido trabajadora del campo durante nueve, año, nueve años. He hablado por mucho, mucho de los derechos de los trabajadores del campo. Y he apoyado mucho sobre las injusticias que hay en el campo. Este, hoy represento al Centro Obrero. Y estoy a favor de la ley H-2812 y la S-1833. Okay. Uh, good morning, members of the committee. My name is Patricia. I've been a farm worker for the last nine years, and I've spoken about farm worker rights, um, and I've supported justice for other farm workers for a long time. Today, I represent the Pioneer Valley Worker Center, and I am in support of the bill H-2812-S-1837 uh, because it would allow me and others, um, other mother farm workers to take care of their children. Como madre duele mucho dejar a nuestros hijos eh, al cuido de las niñeras para ir a trabajar. Es natural que queremos comunicarnos por veces con nuestros hijos desde el campo, pero en el, en el campo no nos permiten estar este, en contacto con nadie más, no, no, los deja, no los permiten usar los teléfonos para saber cómo están nuestros hijos. Este, una vez yo saqué mi teléfono y mi jefe me gritó, me dijo, vienes a trabajar, no estar hablando por teléfono. 
y no es porque yo quisiera hacerlo, sino porque lo necesito para saber cómo está mi hijo. As a mother, it hurts my heart to have to leave my child behind. It's natural that we want to communicate with them during the day. Um, I've been yelled at various times by my employer because I take my phone out to check to see how my son is doing. One time I took my phone out and I was told that I had to put it away because I was here to work, not here to talk to my kids. Este, me gustaría que los dieran un día de descanso para poder pasar con mi hijo y el salario que me pagan es de 13.75, no es suficiente para cubrir los gastos del cuidado de mi hijo y pagar la transportación para que lo lleven al campo, tampoco me pagan horas de overtime. Eso me ayudaría mucho para pagar el cuidado de mi hijo y pagar este el transporte y ahorrar dinero para el tiempo de frío porque ya es esa temporada se termina y los quedamos sin trabajo. Um, me, me, me permito. Oh, okay. Uh, I would also like a day of rest because I would like to spend time with my child. At the same, the wage that I get paid, which is thirteen seventy five, is not enough to cover the expenses I have to care for my child, like a babysitter and the transportation to the farm. They also don't pay me any overtime. That would help me. Uh, cover the pay expenses for my child and also to help me pay for um, transportation and also save for the expenses that I have during the winter time because now that the winter season is coming, I won't have any work. Y también como los demás compañeros que han trabajado en el campo, que, que trabajan y siguen trabajando en el campo, fuimos afectados por la pandemia porque este, nosotros tuvimos que seguir trabajando, no los dieron este, pues, un día, de, de, no los dieron descanso, no los dieron protección, nosotros tuvimos que seguir trabajando sin el protocolo que se tenía que seguir de distanciamiento, de mascarillas y de guantes. Um, also, like my other uh, fellow workers, I also was very affected by COVID-19 and we had to keep working during COVID-19. They didn't give us any PPE. They didn't allow us to safely distance. They didn't allow us to um, protect ourselves. We still had to keep working on the farms. Y este, las horas de mi de trabajo este, esta temporada fueron más cortas por las inundaciones, porque él dañó todo lo que fue los cultivos, las verduras, las frutas, todo se echó a perder. Este, y, no la, y, y, a, y a, este, a, los, a los jefes de las fincas, a ellos les dieron este, su dinero, ellos no perdieron nada, en cambio nosotros sí tuvimos que perder horas y dinero. Um, and similarly, I was affected by the floods where a lot of farms were destroyed um, had destroyed crops and I lost a lot of my work hours at that point and this government did give farmers uh, money to recoup their losses but in turn we didn't get anything to supplement our loss of hours and our loss of wages. Y no es la primera vez que el estado de Massachusetts a nosotros los trabajadores del campo los han dejado al olvido. As, este, siempre ha sido así, siempre nunca los han tomado nosotros en cuenta. Y yo les pido, por favor, que voten a favor de este proyecto porque así este, los ayudarán a remediar un poco el daño que los han hecho nosotros los trabajadores del campo. Muchas gracias por su tiempo. And this isn't the first time that we've been forgotten um, by the state of Massachusetts and by its laws. It's happened before, but we're asking you to please vote in favor of this bill as this would allow us to be represented and have a little bit of support uh, based on the work that we do as farm workers. I thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you. And that, that's it. Those are, those are all our, our workers speakers. Thank you. Thank you to them. Uh, any comments or questions? Seeing none. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you all. Uh, next up is Iris Eileen Coloma Gaines. Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you. 
Okay, great. Thank you so much. Now we can see you. Perfect. Um, I would like to thank Chairman, uh, Chairman Kuzak, Chairwoman Moran, and members of the committee for allowing me the opportunity to testify today. My name is Iris Coloma Gaines, and I am the language access attorney at the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute and a member of the Fairness for Farm Workers Coalition. I'm a Massachusetts native who resided in Philadelphia for 18 years. For 17 of those years, I represented farm workers in the state of Pennsylvania with issues surrounding their employment at farms. I come before you today to testify in support of an act establishing fairness for agricultural laborers, House Bill 1837 and Senate Bill 2812. Farm workers deserve to benefit from Massachusetts state minimum wage and overtime pay. These workers work long, arduous hours and are at greater risk of work injuries than employees in other industries. Farm worker jobs rarely, if ever, have benefits like health insurance, vacation, or sick days. In many instances, workers are recruited from their home states to work in farms in Massachusetts and in other states. Based on statements made by farm labor contractors to workers about the terms and conditions of the work, workers make the difficult decision to leave their families behind to travel up the eastern coast to work at farms in, a, in various states, including Massachusetts. Despite the promised wages, other deductions are made from workers' pay for transportation, food, and other costs that are not disclosed at the time of recruitment. Under federal law, these deductions are illegal. However, these deductions routinely occur, which decrease the already abysmal wages farm workers are currently entitled to in Massachusetts. After many years of traveling to farms to work, some of these workers will decide to settle into the communities in which they have worked and move their families to states in the Northeast like ours. Unfortunately, many of them are forced to leave the agricultural industry due to the substandard wages. Because the exemption from minimum wage and overtime, farm workers and their families suffer high rates of poverty. Contributing to farm workers' inability to provide for their families is the seasonal nature of the work they perform. These exemptions keep farm workers in poverty. The exemptions were originally adopted from the Fair Labor Standards Act. The legislative history for the exemptions points to reasoning that no longer applies to many 21st century farms. There are still small, small family owned farms, but more and more agricultural employers are large lucrative businesses to which minimum wage and overtime exemptions should not apply. For too long, farm workers have been invisible, but yet essential to getting food to our tables. This bill would place farm workers on equal footing with workers from other industries in Massachusetts. Nothing more, nothing less. Massachusetts needs to be at the forefront of protecting farm workers and their families and pass an act establishing fairness for agricultural laborers, House Bill 1837 and Senate Bill 2812. I respectfully urge you to favorably report this bill Thank you for your attention and your consideration. Thank you, Iris. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, Ian Roadwalt. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you. All right. Uh, Honorable Chair Moran, Chair Kusak, and committee members, thank you for the time to speak today on behalf of the H2812 S1837, an act establishing fairness for agricultural laborers. My name is Ian Rodewalt, and I'm the field organizer for the Western Mass Area Labor Federation, a coalition of more than 60 public and private sector unions in Hampton, Hampshire, Franklin and Berkshire counties, representing 50,000 union workers in the region. And I'm speaking today uh, on behalf of the organization. Farm workers have historically been excluded from the ability to organize under the National Labor Relations Act, as well as the federal minimum wage and overtime protections in the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. The reason they were excluded is because when President Franklin Delano Roosevelt sought to pass these acts in order to get the votes of Southern politicians, he excluded agricultural laborers who at the time were primarily black in the Jim Crow South, itself a legacy of chattel slavery. Today, farm workers continue to be primarily black and brown. 
Farm workers in Massachusetts earn an average of $13,000 a year and are not entitled to any overtime pay despite working an average of 55 to 70 hours a week. The subminimum wage of farm workers, as you've heard, can be as low as $8 an hour, and farm workers experience extreme poverty at twice the rate of other Massachusetts workers. To reiterate what was said by my colleagues earlier, many farm workers in Massachusetts struggle to buy the very, produ the, the very food that they produce. This is an abject moral failure that we must address. The Fairness for Farm Workers Act eliminates this subminimum wage of $8 an hour, allows farm workers to earn up to 55 hours of paid time off yearly, and to take two paid 15 minute breaks when working more than eight hours a day. Additionally, the act provides farmers with a tax credit to support them in offsetting overtime labor costs. Massachusetts would be joining seven other states which currently include farm workers in their state minimum wage, including Connecticut, New York, and California, uh, which will pay or which currently pay or will soon pay $15 to farm workers and eight other states who uh, pay some or all over uh, of their uh, overtime to their farm workers. We at the Western Mass Area Labor Federation urge the committee to vote favor favorably in support of H2812 S1837 to lift farm workers out of po poverty and end the leg legacy of racism that has historically excluded farm workers from being from from minimum wages and overtime pay and the second class and uh, removes them lifts them out of the second class status that they currently reside in. Thank you for your time. You Ian, any comments or questions? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, Nico Dominguez Carrero. Hi there, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, awesome. Uh, good morning, members of the committee. My name is Nicolás Dominguez Carrero. I'm a junior at Harvard College studying environmental science and public policy, focusing on climate change and health. I have worked with unhoused immigrants at Boston Healthcare for the Homeless and published health equity research on Latina community health workers with the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Equity. I'm also a coalition coordinator with the Massachusetts Fairness for Farm Workers Coalition. Today, however, I'm speaking as a member of Harvard Undergraduates for Environmental Justice, a student group educating and mobilizing, mobilizing members of the community um, to protect the earth. And I'm testifying in support of H2812. Uh, as students at Harvard, we benefit directly from farm worker labor. We are part of Massachusetts and the majority of our food um, comes from within the Commonwealth. This means that um, of the 22,000 meals served per day, 5 million meals served a year, um, much of that food was planted, grown, and harvested by farm workers. Um, they are essential to our education and we are very grateful for their labor. As members of Harvard Undergraduates for Environmental Justice, we find it unjust and concerning that these farm workers, so critical to the daily operations of the university, do not receive a minimum wage like every other worker. In August, I coordinated a labor justice panel where Maya McCann, a lawyer for the coalition, spoke to the ongoing labor injustices farm workers face, and many students were similarly astounded to learn that Massachusetts, one, hosts so many farm workers, and that they did not receive the same state minimum wage as other workers. This is a testament to the ongoing erasure of farm workers and their struggles in this state. As you heard today, farm workers lost up to almost half of their working hours in some cases due to the summer's flooding, already earning less than the minimum wage. And more concerning, um, many of them did not receive any financial assistance from their employers for their reduced hours. So it seems that farmers received 20 million in aid, but farm workers were left behind in the state's response and did not receive the same care. Floods are not the only climate hazard that are impacting farm workers, with farm workers dying at rates 35 times higher than other workers due to extreme heat. And important to note here that public health science shows that poverty is a major social factor influencing the impact of extreme heat on health. With more income, farm workers would be able to access health care, reduce their rates of food insecurity, which are already really high, and buy cooling technologies for their home. This bill represents a critical climate adaptation action that would provide farm workers with the income they need to withstand the impacts of climate change. I want to highlight that healthy farm workers are also not only important for equity concerns, although I think that should be reason enough. Uh, for, to pass this bill, increased heat is known to reduce uh, worker productivity. Healthy and strong workers would help farmers keep their businesses running and keep profits coming in. So on behalf of HUGE, I ask that you report the bill favorably. We believe uh, it will nurture the health and livelihoods of farm workers, an essential group of workers in the face of climate change, and begin to redress years of structural discrimination faced by this vulnerable community of color.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Seeing none. Thank you. Uh, that is it for sign up for testimony. Is there anyone else joining us who wishes to testify? Hearing none, I will then entertain a motion to close today's hearing. Is there a second? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Close no. Today's hearing is adjourned. Thank you all.